Yeah, welcome everybody to uh, today's YPIC webinar. Um, my name is Florian and I'm more than happy to be your host for today's webinar. And before we get to the main part of today's event, uh, which is of course the webinar by David Del Alamo, I would like to take um, a few minutes and introduce the Young Proteomics Investigators Club and our activities. Um, I think most of you found your way through to this webinar through our official communication networks or communication channels of proteomic societies. Um, so you might be, um, you might know what we do, but still some of you might have found their way to us uh, during other uh, ways. The Young Proteomics Investigators Club is a group of early stage researchers involved in proteomics research in one way or another. Um, and we are the representatives of the Young Scientists community of the European Proteomics Association. Um, we are usually organizing workshops and lectures and, and science industry talks at conferences. Still, um, one equally important goal of us is to inform you on the not strictly science related topics of your careers. Therefore, we try to bring young scientists together over networking hubs and fun evening activities at conferences and, of course, through our webinar series. We are also active over social media, like Twitter and Facebook, of course. So please find us there as well for our latest updates. The QR code that I showed you before and also the link um, should take you to our homepage. In case you didn't see that, that is upa.org ypic. Um, and now I'd like to go back to our webinar series. So we already hosted a few other webinars as part of this series, and you can find all those on our YouTube channel, which is uh, YouTube, um, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club. And you will also find this webinar with a few days delay uploaded on YouTube. So far, we had uh, Leonard Martins talk, uh, talking about what happens to your manuscript or your ma grant application after you've submitted it. We've had Catherine Lilly on the importance of finding the right mentor for you. And we had Connie Chimines, and she was reflecting on poor behavior in academia and the ingredients um, of win-win collaborations. Um, I hope you can already see how the topics presented are of great importance for all young scientists um, and we'd like to continue with this today. For today's talk, um, we will not have open questions. Sorry for the camera. Um, we will not have open questions because I think that was, would result in pure chaos. So we have a questions account. If you go to the uh, participants list um, of this webinar session here, you will find uh, on the top, you will find the questions account. Behind this account is my friend Simon, and he will anonymously take your questions and uh, forward them to me. And at the end of the session, we will, um, I will write, uh, read some of them out and we will get a discussion going with David. So please make heavy use of this. And with that, I'd like to come to the main part, um, which is of course, David Del Alamo, and he will be talking about EMBO activities for early stage researchers. Uh, David is a developmental genet geneticist by training. Um, he started his career by studying Drosophila development. After his PhD, he moved on to the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York first and the Institut Pasteur in Paris later for postdoctoral post research. In 2011, David joined EMBO as a scientific editor for the EMBO channel, journal and in 2016, he became the head of the fellowship program. Um, with that, I'm super happy to have you, David, and the stage is yours. Um, hello, um, um, my name is uh, David Delamo, as you just heard. Um, basically, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, in the first part of the talk, I want to introduce very briefly what the EMBO activities are. Basically, what is EMBO, um, why it was created, and what kind of activities we develop. And the second part of the talk is uh, devoted to activities that might be most uh, mostly interesting for you, uh, for early career researchers. So just to begin, um, EMBO um, <clears throat> is an organization of, of, of life scientists. Um, basically, um, we're trying uh, to build uh, the environment in Europe um in so that uh, scientists can achieve the, their their best work um i'll go into more details later so
So uh, EMBO was created in 1964 with the idea of promoting uh, scientific exchange and training in Europe for molecular biologists. Um, um, there were two goals. The first one was to create uh, programs that would promote this training. And the second one was to build a European laboratory, which is the, the EMBL that probably um, all of you know. So uh, both um, targets were uh, achieved fairly rapidly. In 1966, the, the first fellowships were awarded, the long-term fellowships, postdoctoral fellowships. And in 1974, EMBL was uh, created. So you can see here in 1969, we created another organism, which is the European Molecular Biology Conference, or EMBC, which is basically the political branch of EMBO. So EMBC is formed basically by delegates from the countries that um, um, form part of, of EMBO. You can see here how the um, countries join EMBO. We started with um, only three countries in, in 69, and we are now 30. So what EMBC does is basically provide funding so um, EMBO can develop uh, the programs, the main programs, the fellowship programs, the year program, courses and workshops, etc. Um, as you can see as well, EMBO is completely independent from the European Union or any other um, organizations. Um, we negotiate directly with the countries, with the ministries of science of the countries, um, that makes us completely independent of any political influence. Um, so going into more details about what EMBO tries to achieve, um, EMBO is obviously a non-profit international organization, it's funded by public money. And the idea um, of the organization uh, is um, expressed basically in three pillars. The first pillar is people, we're trying to promote the career of scientists. The second pillar is um, uh, the environment, uh, meaning that we are trying to create a political situation in Europe that helps development of, of science and, and scientists. And the third pillar is communication, which is we're trying to facilitate the exchange of information between scientists, um, their collaboration and networking. So, um, the people that actually form the organization are not just the people working here, people like me, it's the EMBO members. These, these are the most important people. The EMBO members right now are, are close to 2,000 uh, leading scientists that are elected by, nominated and elected by their peers. So other EMBO members nominate them and vote them. Um, they're basically involved in all the stages of EMBO activities. So the, the, the governing, um, um, uh, organism of the organization is the EMBO Council, which is formed by EMBO members. EMBO members form all the committees that make decisions on who gets uh, fellowships, uh, which courses to be organized, etc. And they also provide their expertise. Uh, we contact them, uh, all of them, uh, on a regular basis, asking them for specific questions or uh, asking for their opinion on how to evolve the programs. So this year, we um, elected uh, 56 new MO members from 22 countries in Europe uh, and, and beyond, because we also have associated members that work in other countries uh, beyond Europe, and 43% of them are, are women. So with all these, the money coming from EMBC plus the MO members, um, all the people working here, what we try to develop is what we call the MBO programs. So you can see here basically a list of the programs, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of them. So if we go um, to the first one of the pillars, the first pillar is um, communication. So we try to stimulate exchange of scientific information. How do we do that? We have EMBO courses and workshops and conferences. And of course, we have EMBO scientific publications. So courses and workshops, we organize over 80 scientific meetings in Europe and worldwide um, annually. That's uh, over 10,000 participants. And we provide 35,000 euros for funding for each of these uh, courses. But not only that, we also provide uh, administrative support. We provide posters for um, announcement of each of these uh, courses. We provide some marketing. 
um, we provide a registration system. So basically the organizers only need to focus on, on the scientific part, uh, finding speakers and, and, and dealing with uh, uh, scientific issues. Um, we also organize uh, uh, in collaboration with EMBL, the EMBO EMBL symposia. These are of a different type. The EMBO courses and workshops are organized by scientists who promote um, from the very um, beginning, they, they propose their own ideas. Um, then they're uh, evaluated by a committee formed by EMBO members. But EMBO EMBL symposia are work the opposite way. A committee formed by people from EMBO and EMBL um, try to identify topics that are emerging topics or, or very interesting topics uh, or interdisciplinary areas that are opening up and organize meetings in, in those areas. And they contact potential organizers, um, et cetera. So this is a different type, um, top-down organization of, of meetings, but also very popular and, and normally um, uh, some of them actually uh, run several years in a row. So uh, EMBO has been also collaborating with Basel Life, which is an organization um, that organizes an, an, an interdisciplinary meeting about life sciences in Basel. And EMBO has, organized, uh, has been organizing sessions for a couple of editions already. Um, and this year was uh, the celebration of 10 years of one of the EMBO journals, EMBO Molecular Medicine. And of course, the better known part of scientific communication is the um, uh, scientific journals. You have all, all of you probably have heard about EMBO journal, uh, which is the oldest um, and the most, most uh, popular journal we have. Um, it was created in 1982, um, but we also have EMBO reports that has been running for around 20 years now. Um, both of them are general journals uh, with similar scope. And then we have journals, uh, two other journals um, uh, that have been running for years now, which are EMBO Molecular Medicine and Molecular Systems Biology that are uh, devoted to a specific topics, as, as you can see. Life Science Alliance is a new journal that has been running for a little bit over one year, and is a journal devoted um, to general topics in life sciences. Um, is the, um, and it's a collaboration with College Spring Harbor, College Spring Harbor University Press and Oxford University, um, and Rockefeller University Press. Um, and the idea is to uh, publish all those uh, really good quality papers that are submitted to the journals that form this alliance. Um, and sometimes don't find a good home in journals like Embo Journal or Genes and Development or Journal of Cell Biology. And then we can channel very solid science to Life Science Alliance. And they also publish um, negative data. Um, um, they're not so interested in the, the fanciness or the sexy how sexy the, the research is. So the second aspect uh, we discussed is uh, environment. So how to create a um, better environment for scientists to do the best job. So for that, we have the EMBO Science Policy Program, which basically has um, three different aspects to it. The one is classic science policy, what we have been um, uh, what everybody understands for that, and we have been doing for many years, which basically does, does um, uh, policy analysis, uh, technology assessment, um, also is involved in scientific research integrity. Um, it generates reports on topics that are at the interface between um, science and society, for example. But there's another aspect on the community, which is basically engaging with EMBO members, interact with European institutions, liaise with uh, decision makers. Um, the idea is to try to take some of the uh, problems that scientists are finding to the decision makers so we can uh, uh, benefit the scientific community. And the last pillar is open science, which you know is a, is a topic that of great importance in the last few years. And for that, we are, uh, uh, working again with all these decision makers and European institutions trying to promote uh, standards, open data tools, um, um, and source data, which is a project here that I don't have time to, to talk about. 
EMBO is also involved in, um, um, in other countries. The idea is that science is an international um, enterprise. So um, we have agreements with other countries. At this point, we have two um, um, associated countries, which are India and Singapore. And then we have uh, cooperation agreements with the Ministry of Science and Technology of Taiwan and CONICET in Chile. Um, as you can see in the map, there's other countries that we are involved in conversations with. Um, um, we are just in, in trying to establish collaboration agreements with them. That way, scientists from these countries can exchange with scientists in Europe um, and also organize courses and workshops, etc., etc. And finally, I would like to talk uh, about the how we support uh, talented researchers. I'm going to talk about the Emboyan Investigator Program, and then the part that is mostly most interesting for you, um, which is the Embo Fellowships. So the Young Investigator Program was born some 20 years ago. Um, the idea of this program is to uh, promote networking, mentoring, mentoring, and scientific communication among um, scientists that just started their own laboratory. This program basically doesn't provide money to these uh, scientists. They normally are, are uh, highly accomplished and they are able to get grants by themselves. We provide other things that are uh, somewhat in, in, intangible, but are very difficult to access if you are just starting your lab. Like, for example, we provide grants for you to attend meetings. If you attend the meeting, you are, inv are invited speaker. We cover your expenses. So you are essentially free to a meeting organizer, which is very important. We organize courses on, on um, uh, lab management, um, also a, a, a PhD course for your students if, you're, if you have this uh, deep grant. Um, you also have access to the EMBL core facilities, which are state-of-the-art facilities that you can, you can use here in, in Heidelberg. And we also uh, uh, give you money to organize um, sectorial meetings, which are meetings for, uh, for you to meet other YIPs that are working on, on, on similar topics. So this is a very popular program, it's highly selective. You have to be under 40 and you have to have your lab for at least one year. So it's not easy to get in, but it's, it's a, very interesting, a very interesting initiative. And now we go into fellowships. So we start with uh, our postdoctoral fellowships. Up until now, they have been called Embo Long Term Fellowships. I, I will uh, um, tell you about the changes that we have recently introduced in this program. And basically what you get here is a, is a um, postdoctoral fellowship. You get two years of funding after, right after you finish your PhD. You have, you have to apply within two years. Basically what you get is your salary for two years. You, you get um, and other fringe benefits that are uh, very interesting that we have been introducing over the years to try to cover the, the, the needs of the new postdocs, like uh, family allowance. Basically, every member of your family under 18 allows you to get a, extra money. Also, um, if you have uh, kids under six, you get a childcare allowance, which is money for you to cover, for example, um, kindergarten expenses, uh, things like that. Travel allowance is basically a relocation allowance. We give you money at the beginning to help you move to another country. You also enroll into a private pension scheme that you can continue after you finish your fellowship. And you also participate in two initiatives that are very interesting uh, uh, for networking and collaboration, which is the, the EMBO Fellows Meeting. We have one in Heidelberg and one in the US. The one in Heidelberg is done every year. The one in the US is done every two years. Um, you get you get to participate in Embo Lab leadership courses, which are uh, courses uh, focused on lab management, basically how to solve conflicts, how to deal with people, how to motivate, um, etc. All these um, soft skills that sometimes are not taught uh, to scientists while they are uh, doing research. So this is uh, uh, the evolution of the number of applications. As you can see, the number of awards hasn't evolved a lot over the years, and that's because it, uh, our budget is more or less stable. Uh, but the number of applications has uh, duplicated basically since 2001. As you can see here for the, for the years 2010 to 2016, the number of applications remained more or less stable around 1600. And then there's a, a clear drop in 2017 to around 1200. The reason for that is that we removed the application deadlines. So apparently when you tell people now you can apply whenever you want, they decide not to apply. 
So we lost 25% of our applications there. And this is stable in the last three years, we have got basically 1200 applications each year. So as I said, there's no application deadlines. There's two evaluation cutoffs that are still present. So basically you can apply whenever you want. If your application is received before February, the, actually the second Friday of February, uh, that application will enter the spring call and you will get a decision in June. And if your application is received before the second Friday of August, then the application entered the autumn call and the decision is done uh, in, in December. But as I said, you can apply as long as you're eligible, your eligibility, uh, all the eligibility rules refer to the day that you apply, which can be the date that you want. We have no, well, no problem with that. So how, uh, what are the rules that you have to, or the criteria that you have to meet in order to apply? You, there has to be international mobility, so you have to change country. There's no age limit, but you have to, uh, to be within two years after your PhD. And if you are already at the, at the host laboratory, you have to have been there only for six months uh, tops. Um, all these can be modified, of course, if, as I said, there's limit extensions um, that, uh, that are uh, granted for parental leave, mandatory military service, uh, severe illness or other, um, other issues. Just if you are in those cases, you can contact us and we will uh, give you an answer. Um, and you need uh, at least one paper in an international peer review journal. We also accept preprints. You can list those as, as, as a demonstration of your productivity, but you still need one paper accepted in an international peer review journal. So you cannot go back to the country where you did your PhD. For example, you finish your PhD, move to another country for one year, and then you want to come back, that's not allowed. Um, and of course, you cannot work with your former PhD supervisor. How is these evaluated? But basically we evaluate three aspects of the application, the applicant, the project proposed, and the host that is gonna uh, be your supervisor during this, uh, the development of this project. So for the applicant, basically we look at the scientific achievements. This doesn't mean essentially uh, uh, the name of the journal where your application, where your uh, um, uh, papers have been published, or the impact factor, we don't look at that. What we look at is at the actual side. So we are gonna ask you to describe what you have, what you have done and what you have um, um, discovered. Um, for the host project, we look, you see here a lot of uh, um, um, adjectives. So we, we're gonna look at the, at the novelty, at the creativity, at the interdisciplinarity, the feasibility and the biological significance. Um, one thing important is that we are trying to fund applications that depart from the topic of the PhD. So the idea is that um, the committee tends to favor applications that are very different from what the uh, fellow has already done. Uh, that doesn't mean that you need to change uh, uh, model systems or, or things like that, but it, it, it means that you should significantly change the topic, that not continue doing exactly what you already know how to do. Um, the host, um, where we are looking in, uh, uh, in, in a good host, is that obviously is, is adequate to the work that is going to be um, developed there. When, if you're going to do proteomics, you could need to go to a lab that does good proteomics. It, that's, that's pretty obvious. We're going to look at the expertise, uh, um, um, how many, for example, how many papers or how many years have this lab have been doing that. And of course, the scientific uh, achievements are also important. So that, um, what, what are the contributions of that laboratory to that particular field? So normally the, um, the um, selection occurs in three steps. The first step is a pre-selection. Basically, um, the committee evaluates the uh, incoming applications and one third of the applicants, around one third, are selected for the second step, which is a personal interview um, that is taken, uh, that takes place by um, an animal member. So it's normally a member member or a young investigator that interview each of the candidates and produces a report. And then the third step is what we call main round of evaluation in which all the interviewed up the candidates are re-evaluated by the committee based not only on the application, but also on the interview report. Um, then the decisions are made uh, at, uh, uh, in December or, or June 
uh, at the uh, Embo Fellowship Committee meeting. So, um, as many of you probably know, Embo Long Term Fellowships are now called Embo Postdoctoral Fellowships. Um, what we have done is for people working in the MBC countries, um, um, what we're going to offer now is, is a contract for up to um, two years. So we have um, removed the stipends and now we offer contracts. The way this works is that we provide money for the host institution to issue the contract. So you won't have a contract directly with EMBO, but you have a proper employment contract with all the benefits associated to it. Uh, that means that a pension scheme is not, is not required anymore because you're going to be uh, contributing to the pension of the country where you're working, to the pension system. You will have health insurance, you have an employment benefits, all the benefits normally associated to a contract. Um, what we have maintained, because uh, that's something that is still useful with this contract, is the childcare allowance. So we will still give you some money to cover your expenses for, for a kid. Um, the relocation allowance, of course, because the, uh, moving to one of the countries is still uh, very expensive. Um, of course, you will be invited to participate in the Embo Fellows meeting and in Embo Lab leadership courses. That will stay. So um, I will tell you now a little bit about advanced fellowships very shortly. Advanced fellowships are basically the next two years of your fellowship. If you have had an Embo long-term fellowship, you can apply for an advanced fellowship and get two extra years of, of funding for a total of four. Um, basically, you have uh, um, um, the same benefits. The, it, the advanced fellowships pay a little bit more money per month. Um, if you find a, a position as an independent group leader, while you are on an advanced fellowship, you can take the rest of the money that you have up to 30,000 euros as a startup grant, which is, is usually very useful. And you also get to participate in Embola leadership courses, but this is a special type that are uh, just for group leaders. It's slightly longer and um, a little bit more in analyzing in depth the um, lab management issue. And this is a still a preliminary um, um, experimental program. Um, we only award five uh, of these fellowships per year. And as you can see, it's, it's very competitive. And um, um, it's something that is going to be evaluated now in 2020, and we'll, we'll see how we continue with this, with this program, which is very popular, very helpful. And now I will go into the, the third type of fellowships that we provide, which are the short-term fellowships. These fellowships are a completely different type of fellowships. The idea of these fellowships is for you to go to another country to learn or um, use a model system or a technique um, that other laboratory has and you don't have in your home laboratory. And at the same time, establish new collaborations, new networking opportunities. Um, so um, this is open only for EMBC countries. And uh, the idea is that you go there for a period of between one week and three months, and you develop a project that you are already developing in your, in your home laboratory. So the idea is that this uh, fellowship has to be beneficial for the home laboratory. So as you can see, the success rate is very high. Um, uh, you look at number of applications and the um, a number of awards, and they run parallel, as you can see here, because uh, so far we have been very restrictive with this. Um, basically around 50%, from 50 to 55% of applications get awarded every year. We are not interested in how sexy the project is and how interesting it is, and not even on the particular techniques that you're going to use. Some, in some countries, certain techniques are completely um, usual and everybody uses them. In other countries, that might not be the case. So uh, the important thing here is that you're going to get a benefit, wherever you come from, by going to another uh, laboratory in another country and learning something uh, new that you can bring back to your laboratory, to your home laboratory. So there's no age restriction. You can apply uh, whenever you want, and there's no career restriction. So the only thing we need you to be is at least a PhD student with one year of experience. This one year of experience is, is flexible. The idea of this is that you at least know how to work around in, in a laboratory. So, um, 
if you're going to another laboratory for at least for, for three months, you can really take advantage of the new things they're gonna uh, teach you because you don't have to learn all the basics. But if it's dead of one year, you haven't worked for nine months, we may be able to do a, an exception. As long as you have this experience, you can apply. You can even be a group leader and apply for, for this fellowship. As long as you meet all the eligibility criteria, you go to do exactly um, um, uh, work uh, that you cannot do in your, in your home lab. That's basically the, the point. So of course, international mobility is required. That's in on, on the very DNA of EMBO. All our activities are international. And we only allow, as I said, uh, exchanges between EMBC, EMBC countries. There's no deadline. There's a continuous evaluation system. We only ask people to apply with a, at least three, three months in advance um, before the, the, the visit. Um, uh, because the evaluation usually takes the evaluation and decision around two months with the amount of, of applications we get. So uh, what's the purpose of this? As I said, you visit another country in order for the applicant to take advantage of a new technique or a new piece of equipment or model system, something that is not available in the home laboratory. But this is not a consultation. You don't go for training. The idea is not uh, that that um, you want to learn how to use your machine, so you go to another country and, and learn that. That's not the point. The point is that you are running a project and then you feel that your project could be much better developed by going to another country and add things or do experiments that you cannot do. For example, you work with cell in cell culture and you want to do to add an in vivo model, model to what you're doing. Um, then you go to a lab that has the mice that uh, you're interested in and then you do experiments and suddenly your work is much more interesting because now you have two different models, one of them is in vivo, that, um, uh, that show the same result, for example. So they, uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is that we want new collaborations. So the idea is that the fellowship is a networking opportunity. So you go to a lab of someone you haven't collaborated with, not with, to the lab of the person you've been collaborating for 10, 10 years that won't be able to teach you anything because anything that you could learn from them, you have already learned. So if there's a long-term collaboration with papers in common and even exchanges between the laboratories, we tend to reject those applications. So uh, keep that in mind. And the duration, as I said, is one week to six months, but EMBO only pays for the first three months. The, the, the idea of this is that in many cases, after two months or so, some people uh, really find very interesting results and they would like to stay a little bit longer. Um, so we allow that possibility, but we cannot pay for extra extra time. So the, the maximum we pay is three months. So what are the key aspects of evaluation? As I said, the benefit from the whole, for the home laboratory. So the host laboratory, if, if they benefit from the collaboration, of course, it's, it's good, but it does not require. But the idea is that home laboratory can learn new techniques or expertise of, or simply have access to, to model systems that are impossible to, 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 to have in, in the country or that they don't know how to work with. We look at the feasibility of the project and the scientific summons. So what you have to propose is a project that makes sense, that, that it, it makes scientific sense. You ask us a, a proper scientific question. Um, and the experiments you suggest are going to solve those questions. So, uh, as I said, we don't care about the, how sexy the project is. We don't care if we are going to cure cancer or not. That's not the point of this. The point is, if does it make sense? If it makes sense, that's good. And of course, you have to justify your selection of the host laboratory. You have to tell us why you want to go there. It has to be an adequate laboratory. If you want to learn the technique, they have to know the technique. That's basically the, 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 the point. So these uh, applications are normally very short, very simple in a thousand words or so. You can describe perfectly what you want to do. You have to describe it. So it's, it's not enough with saying, I want to go to this lab to study this protein. That's not a project, that's just a title. Editors, oh, so basically the editors of the journals that I mentioned before, and they write a short report that I read and based on that, and my, my own reading of the application, I don't read all the applications in detail, but I take a look at them. Um, then I make a, a, a decision based on, on this information. But as I said, we are not very picky with this. We are, if, if the application makes sense, um, meets the criteria, 
is normally accepted. And that's why we have a, a success rate of over 50%. And that's essentially what I wanted to tell you about today. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this. Your talk was very detailed indeed. Um, still, I got a few questions and if someone wants to uh, ask another question, please do this in the next few minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the first question that I got. Um, for the EMBO long-term fellowship, is the amount of salary based on the mean income of the postdocs in the country or um, how is this determined? So the, um, the way we have determined, now that we are changing into, into contracts, the way we have determined this is, um, it was quite complicated as you can imagine. We had to get an agreement with 30 countries, but basically we contacted the delegates from for the European Molecular Biology Conference of these countries and ask them to um, uh, provide this information. What's basically the salary of a postdoc in, in those countries. We also contacted the um, institutions in many of these countries directly to ask them what would be a proper salary for postdocs. And also we took into account what we already paid as a stipends. It's, uh, it's already in, in, in many countries, it's already slightly above the, the average uh, salary that a, that a fellow gets. Um, with all that, we propose uh, uh, um, the amounts that are now public. And this, is, uh, this was further negotiated with, the, with each country to see if that was uh, proper, but in general, our fellows in most countries make uh, at least what, an, what a, a normal postdoc makes, a national postdoc makes, and in many countries it's even more than that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what is the determining factor, um, if you would choose one for the acceptance of an application of the EMBO short-term mobility fellowship? So the key factor here is the benefit for the home lab. So that's, that's, that's key. So for example, if you want to go to another country and you want to learn a technique for your own interest as an applicant, or because in the future you want to develop uh, your skills in that particular area, that won't be accepted. The idea is that you're working on a project in the home laboratory, you miss something that would be very helpful for, to develop that particular project, and then you go and, uh, to another lab and learn that something that would be helpful for your project. Then you bring that back to the home laboratory so the home laboratory can acquire that technique. That's not always possible. For example, if you're going to use a very expensive microscope in another country, you cannot just come back to your home lab and bring the, the microscope with you, obviously. Um, but you will learn the techniques that uh, you or, or what you can use that microscope for and then open new possibilities for the rest of the lab and suggest new experiments to other people in the lab. That's the idea that you share your expertise with the lab. And in many cases, you just implement the expertise. For example, you learn how to work with organoids and then you implement the organoid uh, culture in your own lab, things like that. So that's key. The second aspect that is key is that there's a new networking opportunity. Don't suggest uh, or don't apply to go to work with somebody that you have been working with already for 10 years. That doesn't make any sense. The idea is that you find somebody new, so you open a new avenue, new venues for collaboration and networking. Okay, thank you very much. There's another question that came in uh, right now. So for the short-term fellowship, um, can we visit a non-academic lab, for example, a pharmaceutical company in an R&D lab, or does it have to be academic? No, this is allowed. You can, you can visit um, basic uh, research laboratories that are owned by companies, but you can also visit companies themselves. Um, and there is no problem with that as long as we your proposal is not purely applied. The idea if you want to develop a commercial product, um, that's your project, then we won't fund that. But if you are working on basic research and you have a proper biological question that you want to answer, and it happens that this company offers themselves to teach you how to use certain technique because they are selling the machine, for example, or whatever, that is fine. That is, is completely legitimate. There's no problem. Okay. Another one that dropped in right now is um, for the short-term fellowship. Can an international postdoc from a non-EMPC country visit a European country? 
So the nationality of the applicant is not important. So you can be from a non-EMBC country, for example, you can be from the US, which is not a um, your EMBC country, but if you are working in an EMBC country and go to another EMBC country, that's allowed. If, you, uh, if your home laboratory is outside EMBC, you're not allowed to apply. So if you are, you are working in a laboratory in the US, you cannot apply to come to Europe. And if you're working in Europe and want to go to the US, for example, to a, a non-EMBC country, um, in principle, the answer to that is no. But if you want to visit a, a, a laboratory that does something absolutely unique, for example, you need to use a microscope that has been invented by someone in California, then you have to go to California to use the, the machine because there's no other, no other way to use that machine. Then it's fine. Then we can award those. But you have to make sure when you apply to go to a non-EMBC country that the laboratory you want to visit is unique and there's no laboratory in EMBC countries that does the same. And that happens. Sometimes it's a model system that only exists in Japan and you have to go there and work there with a Japanese laboratory or a machine that has been a super resolution microscope or whatever that has been invented in this place in, in the US and then you have to go there. That happens. But um, as I said, the answer is normally no for those. Okay, thanks. And one last very specific question for the long-term fellowship. Um, does mm -hmm. the actual candidate write the application or does the hosting institution write the application? The application must be written by the applicant. But of course, we expect that there's some, um, that there's some help from the host institution. First, because obviously they know better the project. You're going to a, to a laboratory to develop a project that is normally in line with the project that those laboratories have. Um, and second, because they have more experience. It's normal that your host supervisor takes a look at your application. But you should avoid uh, just taking a project from the host lab or written by your host supervisor and just pasting it uh, there. Among other things, because we have an interview and during the interview, it's going to be very clear um, whether you know uh, what the project is about or not. So normally uh, you should do the effort of writing your own proposal with help. Obviously, we always recommend that you have some help from your host uh, supervisor and that the host supervisor reviews your application afterward. But you should try to do it yourself. That's, the, um, that's, that's what, we, what we ask the applicant to do. Okay, then I, I got that one last question and now I'm closing mm -hmm. the questions. Um, if another member of an institute, um, so I guess there was some collaboration between two labs, and if a, another member from an institute goes to a host lab but was not part of the collaboration, um, can he get a short-term fellowship? So you mean if there have been already visits between the two labs involved? Yes, so there have been mm -hmm. visits, it seems, from the questions, but the person that wants to apply for the short-term fellowship was not included in the collaboration. Yeah, normally that's a no, because the idea is this is not a personal, a personal fellowship, this is a fellowship that benefits the home lab. But there could be uh, special situations in which exceptions are, are done. For example, if the previous interaction happened a very long, a very long time ago, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, someone visited the lab. Now both labs work on completely different topics. And now someone wants to visit. For those situations, sometimes we make exceptions, but it's normally an exception. Normally, the answer to this uh, question is a no, because if there are already exchanges, they could already uh, exchange the, you know, the, the knowledge that they uh, that they have. And, and as I said, one of the purposes of this is also open new venues for collaboration and networking. So that yes, in the end, it benefits you in the sense that you have new persons to go to in case uh, you want to do new experiments or, or explore new topics. Okay, um, so that's it for today's meeting. Thank you so much uh, for the very, very interesting and detailed for talk, David. Me. Very great. Yeah, thank you for having uh, for being here with us. Um, I got two last announcements to make. So I was asked to do a quick advertisement of one of our partner um, organizations, which is the 
um, European bioinformatics community and they are hosting their developers meeting next January. So if you're a bioinformatic developer, um, please check out the link that I just posted in the channel for everyone to see. And we are hosting a webinar in the next few weeks or months. Um, so please stay updated and find us for this webinar as well. Um, I wish you all a very nice day. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Again, thank you, David. And have a nice day, all of you. You too. Thank you.